Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the inaugural uh, Department of Epidemiology Centennial Extravaganza. Uh, we're really pleased to be here. We have, I think, a very exciting program for you today. Um, my name is David Chalantano. I'm the chair of the Department of Epidemiology. And I'm not going to stand up here, but my job is to introduce uh, a man who has a room named after him. Al Somer, uh, former dean and faculty member in epidemiology. Thank you, David. It's very exciting, one, to be celebrating the centennial, of course, for the school and to be doing it with epidemiology since this was the first academic department of epidemiology anywhere in the world. So let me do a brief introduction here. Donna Shalala, who is our star today is well known to all of you. She has received more recognition than an hour's introduction would do justice. Among them, the Presidential Medal of Freedom, our nation's highest civilian honor, and the Nelson Mandela Award for Health and Human Rights, just to name two. Instead of recording her, recalling her many honors, I've decided to concentrate instead on an appropriate title for this much titled leader. She was chancellor of the University of Wisconsin. It's hard to consider any rank higher than that of a chancellor. Think Thomas Beckett, Cardinal Woolsey, Thomas More. <laughs> She's also been a president three times of Hunter College, the University of Miami, and now the Clinton Foundation. President is certainly a high office, but has a bit of a rustic nouveau ring to it. And of course, she was Secretary of Health and Human Services for an extraordinary eight years during the Clinton administration. Might secretary be an appropriately august title? I expect so. During the years that I was dean, everyone knew that the single most powerful person in the school was B.J. Adi, my secretary. <laughs> so I'll go with Secretary Shalala. We have a distinguished panel that will explore with Secretary Shalala how the real world works and how it should work in drafting legislation and policy in relation to available data. Its members include our very own president, Ron Daniels, our associate dean for professional practice, Josh Sharfstein, Steve Ganji, who departed us for the provost office, but is a card-carrying epidemiologist and like me, a member of this department. And Laura Cobb, a recent graduate, who's now working at the Data for Health initiative. I can't help but start this off with a few PowerPoints, which are supposed to work. Let's see, here we go. I created this flow chart from personal experience decades ago. We mostly teach you about collecting reliable, unbiased data. We mostly are interested in truth unconstrained by personalities and politics. But I think, as this makes clear, and I learned primarily through the vitamin A work, which you've all heard too much about, uh, that having good data alone uh, doesn't necessarily do you much good. Lots of people will interpret it differently. You eventually have to work through, usually, the collection of additional data and lots of meetings, a scientific consensus. And once you have a scientific consensus, that doesn't necessarily mean that that will lead to appropriate policy because you have competing priorities for the funding, you have media attention, special interest politics, and all the like. And that's essentially what we're going to explore today is this sort of flow chart of how one moves from data to policy. Now just to show you there's something contemporaneous with Secretary Shalala, uh, here's vitamin A. Uh, story being heralded by First Lady uh, Hillary Clinton. So that just brings us back to a period uh, when Donna was, in fact, the First Lady. So it gives us some uh, contemporary relevance. And then I'm going to read to you an article that I cut out many years ago, which I think sets the tone for this and is going to give us some words of wisdom. This appeared in the New York Times. It's called White House Won't Lift Ban on Needle Exchange Funds. After a bitter internal debate, the Clinton administration has decided, 
has declined to lift a ban imposed nine years ago on federal funding for programs to distribute clean needles to drug addicts, even as the government's top scientists certified that such programs do not encourage drug abuse and can save lives by reducing the spread of AIDS. And in fact, it was David Vlahov and this department and his colleagues who did the seminal work on needle exchange. The decision announced by Donna Shalala, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, was denounced by public health experts. The decision came after a week of negotiation between Ms. Shalala's staff and the White House, according to two administration officials. Ms. Shalala had been pressing to rescind the ban and was prepared to defend that decision on Capitol Hill, knowing it was bound to be controversial. But the president's policy advisors feared that Republicans might push through legislation that would strip federal money from organizations that provide free needles. And so that sets up the dilemma that we're going to discuss today. How do you use data when you have all these other issues that are going to intervene with it becoming data-based policy, and I'd like to uh, invite uh, Secretary Shalala and the remaining members of the panel who will discuss this and other issues with her uh, to sit in the front room, uh, front of the room. So, Ron and Donna, why don't you take the uh, chair. And we got the slides off now. Okay, Donna, do you want to say something about that experience? I do. Um, this is a classic issue in uh, public policy and in politics because the data was very clear. And in fact, I was so sure about the data that I got every single senior public health official in the government to sign a letter uh, basically to the president saying the data is clear. We ought to allow um, the CDC to authorize the use of CDC block grant money to the states for this purpose. Now, remember, this is not just the president writing a check and, and sending off the money. We had a block grant from the CDC for public health purposes that went to the states. This was not an eligible activity under that. And so the purpose was to get it as an eligible activity. Um, so we were right on the, on the health issues, absolutely right. There was no question about the data. Someone called from the White House and said, um, tell Secretary Shalala to say that the data isn't clear, that we need to do more studies. I refused to do that. I said, I am perfectly willing to stand up and say the President of the United States decided this was not an eligible activity. But what I'm not going to say, particularly with my public health people standing there, uh, what I'm not going to say is that the data isn't clear about this. So everybody asks me, how do you keep your integrity when someone makes a political decision that's inconsistent with the data? The answer is, you keep your integrity. The president has a perfect right to say that something, that he won't spend federal money on something. Um, what the administration could not do is say that the data wasn't clear and that the science wasn't clear in this case. So we did a number of things. Um, I said that at the press conference. I said the data is absolutely clear, but the president has decided that this should not be an eligible activity. I did not punt. I did not say we have to do more studies. Um, what I did do um, is allow the National Institute of Health to convene mayors and foundations to fund this, and we encouraged uh, non-federal actors, local governments, and I don't know whether Baltimore did it, probably did. Uh, use uh, their own money. We encouraged local uh, local government officials, state officials that wanted to participate with their own money, and foundations. We uh, we really went out after the foundations to encourage them to do needle exchange uh, programs uh, around the country. Now, what happened with the politics? The president now, by the way, admits that that was a mistake. But it wasn't a mistake for him in the political context. He was under pressure not to do it. We we're about to go into an election. And um, it was not the Republicans that were pressing on him, but the Democrats themselves in Congress that were saying to him, oh my God, you're handing them an issue. Please don't do this. Everybody thought it was the drug czar 
that had pressed him, because the drug czar had traveled with him the week before, but it really wasn't the drug czar. It was liberal Democrats in the Congress putting pressure on the president not to hand over an issue. So that's the way we handled it. And, 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 and you know, it's, it's it. tricky, but um, it doesn't mean that you can, you have to go into government and give up your integrity, deny the science, you simply, have to find a way uh, to manage a situation when the president in a political climate makes a decision that you think is, um, um, is both not the right decision, though I defended his right to make the decision, I didn't say at any time that he made the right decision in terms of the science. And that's the story. Terrific. That's my story, at least. <laughs> yeah. And you're sticking with it. But and since then, it, Bill Clinton the has admitted it. that needle exchange, that the science was there, that he probably should have done it. Ron. So it's a, it's a, it's a really good tale. In a lot of ways, it has some really interesting components um, as we think through this issue, which I should say, uh, as a one-time law professor who uh, thought a lot about uh, this issue of how do you take ideas, evidence, consensus in the academic community and translate it into policy, knowing that once you get into the messy world of public policy, you meet people and decision makers who have a different value set than you have. Um, you have uh, people who, quite apart from the values, just have a strong commitment to self-interest. And however compelling your argument is, even as against a consensus of values, it gores their rocks, and they're just going to fight to the finish in the political process uh, to thwart your efforts at reform. I mean, we just know that's the nature of democratic uh, politics. Uh, so. Um, the challenge, of course, is in the pure case where you have a clear consensus with the evidence and then you take it into the messy political process um, and if ultimately you can't figure out how to manage those politics and you can't get your first shot, I love the sense that you sort of back up again and say, okay, so we'll think about some temporizing measures here. We get some pilot projects and these are the, these are the techniques that we use, of course, when you know you can't win it um, across the board, so you have some other options here, which you very adroitly nursed in that situation. But what I think about, um, and I, perhaps I think about this, and it's um, appropriate to be thinking about it in this room, because it goes back to the moment we had um, not so far back around Sandy Hook, and you know the sense that you know, here was a moment when something that we know around gun control, there is a strong consensus, we believe, in the um, enlightened academic community and beyond around what are a defensible set of interventions, public policy interventions, that should work uh, to substantially reduce the risk of injury uh, from, uh, from gun use. And we thought that having a moment here where you marshal the evidence, you um, have, have, a, have um, an opportunity to disseminate that on a broad stage and then think that, um, you know, that, the, that the softening of the political process, which we know from Colleen's work, was there was a moment there when people were opening up to this. We thought we had a moment when the evidence would prevail. And alas, of course, we know that um, at least on a national level, nothing moved, and a quite remarkable moment. So I say this because I think there's, at least for me, I think there's a growing sense that in a meaner, more polar, polarized political environment, the, um, I think there's a need for those of us in the academic community to start thinking about, and I'm, you know, given your experience, you'd be perfect to comment on this, but to think about what are the sorts of institutional changes we need to somehow discipline what is a much more polarized set of political um, positions. And wondering, you know, quite apart from what we do in the academy, what are the sorts of intermediaries or others who can somehow discipline the political debate so to make it more, make the political process somehow more receptive to the evidence, to the principle that we uh, seek to bring to bear on the political process. But what was a concern 15, 20 years ago, surely in this environment must be so much more acute now, that just on so many issues, the evidence 
doesn't seem to get traction where um, the parties are so deeply polarized. You know, I would argue that uh, mostly we win on the evidence. Uh, we, uh, you see the big issues um, uh, like that one, and I always believe that you ought to have plan B. That it, you ought to have, if you hit a brick wall, you've got to, you've got to go in another direction. Plan B in gun control may turn out to eliminating the exemption for gun uh, people that make guns so that they are no longer protected uh, by the courts. They're no longer indemnified. Mm -hmm. And that may be plan B that makes it very difficult. Um, and, and there may be other aspects uh, of that. Um, but that's a very difficult issue. Look, I, I, my own view is that if you've got the evidence, you've got to be willing to lose. Look at what we did on tobacco. We took on the tobacco industry, determined to make them the bad guys, which they were, and we were willing to go to the Supreme Court, even though most people thought we were going to lose. In the process of going to the Supreme Court, using the law as advocates, we did all sorts of other things that turned them into the bad guys. We lost the case, eventually got legislation, but in the process demonstrated that kids were being recruited by the tobacco industry, and we got state and local governments to move the selling of tobacco to back rooms, basically. We got grocery stores uh, to move it. We got, we got it moved away from schools. We, we ran whole programs to get it out of government offices and out of universities. In some ways, we won the argument based on the science, even though we lost that Supreme Court case. That's an example of activist government that everybody rails against, where we took a risk. And you know, the Attorney General said to me, we're probably going to lose this case. And my response was, ah, but we get it in the public sphere, and we get the evidence, and we um, and we will eventually get the legislation uh, that we need. But meanwhile, we get state and local government and everybody else to take on the tobacco industry with us. So in some ways, we won that while losing the big case. So there are different ways of approaching public policy. You just have to be nimble, creative, um, and willing to lose in one sense while you can win the big game. Terrific. Steve. I, I guess just to follow up on that, you know, you, you, I think tobacco is a good case where uh, the mountain of evidence had from been collected health. from public health had been collected and, and accumulating for years. Uh, there are harder problems like guns where the ability to do the research has been inhibited by policies that prevent the collection of, of high quality data and the kind of data that you would need to make those kind of decisions. How can we help change those policies to free up our ability to actually address the questions and it's collect even, the good data? It's not even collecting, it's even the NIH funding studies. I mean, That's it's right. more fundamental. Right. 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 I mean, it's a deliberate suppression of evidence generation. Yes. Mm -hmm. And trying to get money for those studies was always difficult if it was labeled that way. I, I would have to argue that investigator-driven studies in the NIH tradition is, far, is a far better way to do it without identifying specifically uh, what you're funding. But the, NI, the NRA will go after you either way. We've just got to figure out creative ways to do it. We've got to get the foundations organized to fund that, those kinds of studies. Mm -hmm. Um, and there are lots of foundations that are very interested, but we've got to do the kind of deep studies that public health can do over a period of time, and then we have to be creative about, I think, using the law um, to go after the people that sell guns and the people that make guns in this country. Great. I actually think that's the next great public health issue for us. Um, Great. So I, you mentioned a little bit about foundations, and given your new role um, at the Clinton Foundation, I just wondered if you could speak a little bit about what the role is about nonprofits and foundations kind of in bridging the gap between evidence and sort of policy and other actions. Well, I think that um, we're interesting because we're an operating foundation. So the Alliance for a Healthier Generation, which is one of our spinoffs, um, decided to take on the issue of childhood obesity. Everybody's working on that issue. 
the, we got lots of evidence on that issue, but Clinton is a different kind of person. He's willing to go make partnerships. So we went to McDonald's and said, stop marketing French fries um, and, um, and Coke, or Pepsi or Coke, I guess it is for McDonald's, uh, to little kids. Uh, we'd like you to think about marketing uh, fruit cups and salads and milk. And so 70% they stop that marketing. 70% of the families that are buying those kids' meals are now getting the milk um, and the fruit cups and the salads along uh, with hamburgers. Now, that's not um, a perfect step. Um, the foundation went to all of the uh, soda manufacturers and said, Let's figure out a way that you can reduce the amount of sugar that's being sold in those machines in schools in this country. And they actually did that. And when you walk into schools across the country, there's actually a reduction. The willingness to go to the industry, which gets you 10% you know, of the way or 20% of the way while everybody else is working on the other issues, actually can make an impact. So I, um, the foundation is not is interested in partnerships that produce those kinds of outcomes, but we're willing to talk to the industry um, and don't apologize for it in the process of trying to deal with a major issue like childhood obesity. Now that program is jointly with the American Heart Association. So in some ways we had cover. We were, we were partners with the American Heart Association on those forays into uh, uh, talking with the industry. But that's, that's another way to do it. Um, to me, that raises the question, there are certain things where the evidence is crystal clear, and then there's the political challenge of trying to get it done. Um, and then on other issues, the evidence isn't so clear, but you have a political opportunity to get something done that you think may be a really good thing. You know, So you could say, uh, making a deal with McDonald's on the one hand, maybe we're going to have fewer kids getting the wrong, you know, uh, the wrong food. On the other hand, maybe it's going to just help McDonald's survive and get more kids through the door and ultimately... That's not such a great thing. So you could kind of see it both ways. I'm guessing there probably isn't a definitive study in that. So in so many areas, you've got some data. You're seeing an opportunity. How, how, how would, do you think um, people here who are doing the research should think about how policymakers react in this situation? You know, sometimes policymakers, if they're smart, will run with what data they have. My first day in office, uh, someone from the National Institutes of Health came running in and said, we've got this study, and it shows if you put kids on their back, you can reduce sudden infant death syndrome. And I said, why is that? And they said, we don't know. All we know is if you put kids on their back, you can reduce sudden infant death syndrome. Now, should we have waited? They said, we're going to do 50 more studies to try to figure out why that is. And, and I sat there and thought, eh, you know, why don't we run a little campaign on this and see if it has an impact? And we'll study at the same time, so we build in an evaluation. So we ran a campaign called Back to Sleep. And, you know, I even got the, the diaper companies to say this way up. <laughs> and all the hospitals. And the only problem we had was that uh, mothers would take the kids home and their mothers or their grandmothers would say, ah, the doctor doesn't know what he's talking about and flip them over. <laughs> so we actually ran the campaign with uh, AARP, <laughs> among other things. We ran it in different languages. Sudden infant death syndrome has reduced, been reduced by 70%. We know more things now, but there is a public health outcome, an initial study, that we decided to run with. So you take some risks when you're a policymaker. Um, but, you know, sometimes it's just enough evidence that it's worth the risk. So there are probably thousands, hundreds of thousands of babies all over the world that are alive now because we took a piece of data and didn't wait for the rest of it and uh, ran a campaign and figured out how to, how to get the word out. Can I, I just want to go back to, and uh, you might be surprised that I would say this as someone who's got legal training, but your, your um, interest in pursuing uh, some of these issues, public health issues in the courts, and I, again, um, I think about how well courts are in dealing with data, 
with evidence. And you know, it's quite striking. Again, this just goes back to my days when I was called as an expert witness on a, on a few different matters. And I look at actually the adversarial process is actually pretty lousy in dealing with data. That it was really hard because um, when I was being deposed, you would have a view of where you believe the consensus in the literature were, was, uh, that you would um, essentially make the case for why the evidence says this or that. This is, you know, typically, this is in the case of dealing with uh, uh, industrial organization issues. But invariably, uh, the other party would have their expert who would report a very different view of where the consensus was. And what I found was really quite striking was that a judge that's trying to make sense of this, two very polarized, polarized positions, um, has a really hard time in some sense making their way through all the noise to say, look, I understand that uh, you know, the, the adversarial process produces these extreme views, but I know where the consensus in the literature is and we can move on that. The judges didn't have that capacity. And so very often what you were left with was actually a sense of not that they were being moved by the quality of the data, it was often by the quality of the advocacy, or uh, sometimes you just had a sense of, I throw in all the data out because I just can't deal with the complexities here of the different studies. And you know, even when you had one or two studies being marshaled <laughs> by your opponent as against the 20 you had on your side, judges had a hard time managing that. Yeah. So is that a really good place to deal with evidence? <laughs> um, but we didn't just use the public health evidence. What we did was write, um, or David Kessler wrote, an FDA rule basically asserting FDA's jurisdiction over uh, the tobacco companies, arguing that it was a drug delivery device. I think that was the test, that it was a drug delivery device. Our campaign simply said that the cigarette companies should not be marketing to children. Now, why did we pick on the kids? Not only because you can make a big political argument about protecting kids. If the kids didn't smoke before they were out of high school, they were never going to smoke. So we had that piece of evidence from public health. So the campaign we ran, meanwhile, the courts were looking at the drug delivery device. We had all these people um, that were testifying who had worked for the, uh, for the tobacco companies that were testifying, yes, indeed, they marketed to kids. But we were really taking on the marketing to kids campaign because that's the way we were going to get to the states and local governments and to schools. So it was a very sophisticated approach. On the one hand, we were um, arguing it was a drug delivery device using the courts. On the other hand, we had evidence that the companies were actually marketing uh, to children, and we took them on on that piece. So that also, go ahead. Yeah, and yeah. I, I was going to say in that case, you lost the Supreme Court decision but won the war. Yep. In part because exactly. they said you made the case, but you just didn't have the authority. And yep. then you went to get the authority. And then it took but, until your administration, you were in office to get the authority for it. Uh, I, I was an intern at the time <laughs> when the first rule Luckily, we had a bunch of Republicans on the I Supreme was, Court who did the exactly. smoke. So yeah. but, they were willing to say but, nasty things about it. Well, what concerns me now is that it's not the courts looking at evidence and overruling on a, a question of law. They're interpreting the evidence. Sometimes they'll say, uh, and with some of these First Amendment cases, there's no evidence that any of these rules work when there is evidence. And I, I've noticed that there's a tendency for people who are overruling public health, like you gave a, a great example with the syringe exchange situation, that, right. that it was a decision made even given the evidence. Yeah. But what sometimes happens is people, they don't want to make that decision. They want to have their cake and eat it too, and they will distort the evidence. They will say, I don't know if you remember, President George Bush the Younger said, uh, we can do all this research with stem cells, therefore we don't need to do any more stem cell research. And that, if he were to say in that case, you know, it's just wrong to do stem cell research and we're gonna have, it's gonna suffer as a result, that then he would be kind of taking responsibility for his political position. Instead, it was a bit of a perversion of the science to say, actually, we don't have to face any consequence because we can do all kinds of research with stem cells. And yeah. I draw the distinction between someone maybe overruling an evidence-based position and someone distorting the evidence to kind of justify. No, and, and we're always going to have that. If you're talking about the anti-scientific bent, uh, you know, I used to I used to sit there with my hands on my head, saying, 
how come these guys never studied science when they were studying political science, these members of Congress? <laughs> I mean, they, uh, I always thought there should be a, a science requirement just for people that wanted to run for office. I mean, that was my uh, view of the world. We're going to lose some of those cases. You're absolutely yeah, I mean, right. How, how would you recommend people here, people at the school, objecting to people kind of manipulating science to justify a political position, as opposed to kind of taking a responsibility for their political position. Is there any, any no, way to penetrate through that? You just, yeah, I keep talking about creativity, about thinking. I once had to deal with the bovine growth hormone issue in Wisconsin, in which the legislature just wanted to ban it. And, and the, the guys that uh, made milk weren't too happy about that because they sort of liked it. And um, so what we did, I talked to the governor, um, who was not anti-science, and I said, uh, he said, you gotta send some people up to testify. So everyone I sent up to testify was a pediatrician. <laughs> and when the pediatrician said, yeah, the milk is fine for kids, then we got rid of that issue, at least temporarily uh, for that time. So you've just gotta figure out on each of these issues, if you get stopped in the courts, you have to find another way to take the evidence and to run through it. Sometimes you have to sit on the evidence for a while. Um, because there is no, you don't see an opening. The great running backs at the University of Miami were great because they waited, they had patience and waited to see the opening that they could run through. And in some ways, those of us in public health and in public policy have to do that at the same time. It's, some of it is timing. It's very frustrating when you have clear evidence, uh, very clear evidence. In Miami, in Florida, I supported our, our pediatricians when they took on the state, which wanted to ban pediatricians from asking families about whether they had a gun in the house. And we won in the courts. Most of the other universities were scared to death of letting uh, their people go ahead with the courts. I said, you go ahead. I said, if you need money for the case or you need us to file an amicus, we'll file an amicus. So sometimes it takes a little bit of courage, but um, we're not going to win them all, and the courts are different uh, uh, today, but um, I've seen enough cases where we can get around. I'm just an optimist about this. I mean, I love, you give me a hard issue, I want to spend some time uh, figuring it out. The hardest issue I had as secretary was when I had a room like this, I called in all the public health officials. The president had said to me, we've got to get all the kids in, in the country immunized by the time they're three. And we're not getting them immunized. We look like Haiti. Only 50% of our kids are getting immunized before they go to school, before they're three. And you got to get that done. The public health officials said to me, you can't do it because we don't have a universal health care. And it's too expensive. And the parents don't know the names of these diseases. And they have to go to a public health office to get the shots free. And, and you know what I did? I pulled out of my purse, I don't have my purse here, a postcard that my golden retriever had just gotten from his vet. <laughs> and it said, dear Bucky, please come in and get your next shot. <laughs> and I said to, I mean, Phil Lee was sitting there. Every great person, in, um, Joe Buford was sitting. I, I waved it and I said, listen, if the vets in this country can get the dogs immunized, particularly my dog who can't read, uh, <laughs> We can figure out a way to do this, and we figured out a way to do it. We had 90% immunization by the end of the first term, and we just went at it. We went at it with Congress. We went at it with the pediatricians who weren't giving the shots. We, we went at it with, you could walk into a hospital in Baltimore, and they would have the kids' immunization record, and even if they were just in with their mother trying to see someone, they would shoot them up if they didn't have their next shot. Um, so. I got Gerbers to put it, uh, the schedule on the back of their boxes because they came in to ask me for a favor. I said, I'll do you the favor, but you got to put the immunization. Set. McDonald's put it on their tray liners. We now have a system, without having universal health care, of pretty much getting all the kids in the country immunized. And I just, I just think in public health, if you really want to make a difference, you got to be willing to take people on. And you got to have a golden retriever. <laughs>
It sounds like we need two new departments, one the Department of Pragmatic Public Health <laughs> and the second the Department of Political Science and Legal Affairs. Steve, did you have something about this? Well, I, I was just thinking about the, the portrayal, you know, since there are a number of academics and students who are, who are in their training now, um, uh, portrayal of epidemiologic data. Um, you know, we, we, we get bombarded with it on a daily basis. And, and I wonder from a policy or maker's point of view, is there anything that we can do to try to make it more appealing and uh, uh, better used for policy makers? You know, it's, uh, but you're doing it now. The new um, epidemiology's relationship with cancer, for example, mm -hmm. is having a huge impact because suddenly the cancer people decided, decided that they Prevention really, they really yeah. needed it, <laughs> right. all of you, in the implementation phase. Mm -hmm. That it wasn't just knowing the science, and it, but, but in the translations phase that they need um, all of you. And I, I think you make partners with cancer, that's where the action's going to be. Um, and it's those partnerships, those interdisciplinary partnerships with medical science that is going to move um, because those partnerships are very powerful in public health. And, um, and frankly, they can't do what they want to do without you. Yeah. I, I will say, you know, I agree with you, but it's hard to convince NIH of the value of not finding a new gene, right, or not finding a new drug when you're trying to do implementation research or translational research like that. And, and I think it's in, in incumbent on us to try to uh, advocate as well as find advocates like you who will, who will state that. Do you, I, Steve, I guess uh, maybe an unfair question, but do you feel, this is you, the field of epidemiology, do you feel any... <laughs> Man, the microphone. No, for all of epidemiology, yeah. please. You're down the hall from me in the provost's <laughs> office. Uh, but do you feel any sense of concern or, dare I say, responsibility for how I, a member of the lay public, even interpret, you know, I'm thinking, you said cancer is where it's at. Um, we've gone, you know, we've, we've, we've uh, been riding this wave around, you know, red meat, good, bad, caf coffee, you know, bad, now good, um, just, uh, and, and, and good in large doses. Um, so, you know, I think it's <laughs> not the red meat. Um, but I think there is the something, red wine. right, yeah. but we've gone, th right, so we've gone through, I think it goes back to the sense of um, what we're really fighting for is good, robust, consistent evidence, and yet, you know, um, we're often confronted with the fact that we're getting drips or drabs of this, and it's actually hard. Now, forget about course, I'm just thinking about the lay public of being able to think about what is best practice and what is responsible in light of the latest missive to come out of the community. So, I guess what I'm asking, and this goes to you as, as well, Donna, is, do we need um, some kind of scrupulously independent, and I thought this was actually the role of the academy, but do we need something between the academy and the public or the academy and decision makers that is going to be able to interpret, weigh, evaluate the evidence, particularly epidemiological evidence, so we know what is real and what is aberrational and, um, and should not uh, have purchase? Well, we actually, you know, do have, as imperfect as it may be, I mean, the, the NRC, National Research Council, the now NAM, IOM, uh, and the National Academy of Sciences, often their brief is, tell us what the real, real is here. Does but that they, I'm sure they can be better mechanisms. Does that, 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 that work well enough? Yeah, I think it works pretty well, particularly when uh, government commissions them to take a look at the evidence. So we basically stop the ancient, Agent Orange controversy by finally getting the what was then the IOM the NAM um, to take a very careful look at the evidence there. I mean, there are always going to be fringe groups that questioned it, but they finally got their arms around um, that issue. So we do have institutions in our society um, that can do this. One of the problems is the press. 24-hour press, you think it's a problem for the politicians. It's a problem for researchers, too, because people are running with evidence 
And um, when, I, uh, when I get online, I'm always getting bombarded with a latest study. I don't know who did that study, but it's always a public health study. I'm, I'm the same as you. You're getting uh, confused about, uh, uh, because we're being bombarded. So the fact that we have a media now that's 24 hours, people are running with their findings, um, uh, it makes it it makes it it makes it a little bit more complicated. I think uh, we have another colleague here who hasn't said a word. Oh, sorry. Um, so yeah, I guess I had a question, which was around um, as epidemiologists, one of the hardest things that we have to do is come up with research questions. And as a policymaker and someone who's had to take that evidence and translate it, I want to ask: Are we asking the right questions? Um, do you feel like, as a policymaker, you had the evidence you wanted, you were looking for, you needed, and how can, how can there be a sort of a better relationship there? You know, someone just interviewed me who's writing a book on um, the policy offices in government um, and whether those are the right places where policy research ought to be commissioned. And there are a lot of very good public health people in um, HHS, for example, that are doing uh, that kind of research or whether the operating agencies are actually the right place to do it, where they don't have as much credibility. I was once a policy assistant secretary at HUD in the Carter administration. I was very young. I didn't know what I was doing. But I knew enough to go ask the operating people not what questions they wanted answered, but what problems they had. And we actually laid out our research agenda based on talking to the people that actually were running the programs on what hurdles they had, what obstacles they ran into. And then we translated those into research questions. And, and therefore, the fit was much better. In some ways, people in public health and in, in healthcare research, and in health services research, you see more of this, because they're talking to the people that are actually delivering it. So. Um, I don't think you can think up the question in a vacuum. I think you have to talk to the people that are actually doing the work, the on the ground work, and have them provide you with some input so that what, whatever you're doing actually may have some kind of an outcome. We're not absolutely doing basic research all the time. So that's the, that's the only answer I have, and it comes out of my own experience running a policy shop uh, very early in my career, but it's, it's stayed with me. Um, and I've been very pragmatic with policy shops about those kinds of questions. Mary Jo Bain, who uh, ran Children and Families, who was a uh, uh, executive dean at Harvard's Kennedy School, who's a very good uh, researcher in uh, the welfare area and in Children and Families, I always loved talking to her because she had actually run the Department of Social Services in New York State at one point in her career. So she was a distinguished academic. Uh, David Elwood had that same kind of experience. They were distinguished academics who had had on-the-ground experience, so they had a better feel for the right policy questions as they were going on. I often thought that people in public policy schools in particular, because people are always coming to me saying, I just got my MPP, could I make policy here? And I'd say, oh my god, go, you know work in an agency or at OMB or something, get some you know, real experience. You can't just make policy because you have a policy degree. Um, and I always thought that, uh, that that interaction between people that were on the ground and policy researchers were, was very important. I'd just like to make one point. Uh, Ron brought up the question about these confusing studies on uh, Decaffeinated coffee, large amounts of coffee, good for you, bad. Those all come from the Harvard School of Public Health. <laughs> <laughs> um, Laura, since or you're the actually law school or something. <laughs> <laughs> Laura, since you're working now on something important in the developing world, uh, and uh, Secretary Shalala is president of the Clinton Foundation, which is doing a lot in the developing world, uh, maybe you could tell a little about what you're trying to do and and have Donna's response to that. Uh, <clears throat> Sure. So um, I'm part of a uh, Bloomberg Foundation funded project that is called Data for Health. And um, the project's goal is to assist uh, 20 countries to better collect health data, so specifically vital statistics data, as well as non-communicable disease surveillance data. And then the part that I work on is to um, help countries translate that data into um, policy and decisions 
And um, so, you know, we think about how can we better, you know, use the available data, how can we better assist people to do that, but then, you know, when I, when this conversation brings up, even if the data is there, even if the evidence is there, we know the health situation, how do we, how do we actually make that translate into reality? And I think that um, it's a big challenge. <laughs> Um, and we're just, this grant, by the way, is uh, six months old, so we're just getting started in the work. So any advice that you have for us would be wonderful. Yeah, talk to the finance minister. I always <laughs> thought that, <laughs> I always thought that we could move public health faster if we talked to the finance ministers in this country as opposed to just the health ministers. The health ministers were terrific, they got it. And, and they were interested in the data, but they would always say to me, the finance minister is the problem. And you know, when you think about tobacco, for example, in a place like China, uh, the finance minister wants the income from the tobacco tax, and the health minister wants to reduce the number of people that are smoking. It's that kind of tension within a country, the economics of the health care decisions that I think you've got to figure out how to intersect with. And um, getting the finance, I'm, I'm not kidding about talking to the finance minister, getting the finance ministers and the health ministers and the people that do economic development together in a way in which they see the outcomes and, and see what the advantages are of working together, I think would be it's my only idea. <laughs> Why don't we, uh, since we have a few minutes left, let's take uh, questions or comments from the audience. If there are microphones on either side. Don't be bashful, you're never bashful in class, so don't be bashful now. And while you're getting there, I'll just emphasize uh, what Secretary Shalala said. When, uh, when Indonesia was uh, uh, working there, when I was working there with colleagues to get them to do something about their vitamin A deficiency, uh, there was a good friend who sat on their five-year planning board, which was a very powerful position. Uh, and then we would periodically meet, and at the end of the planning process, he came back and he said, Al, it's done. We've got it into the five-year plan. I said, you got it into the health plan? He said, oh, no, who cares about the health plan? We got it into the finance plan. <laughs> so exactly, exactly what you said. Okay. Uh, um, I'm sort of interested in the pragmatic department. The new department. Yeah. <laughs> bad guys, but then we're working with McDonald's and the soda to do, so how do you sort of identify who you can work with and who you have to work against, and I guess more importantly, how do you decide you should switch the relationship you've already set? Mm -hmm. um, you know, different times, uh, different eras have, have different strategies in terms of what you want to do. I'm not particularly an incrementalist. Um, uh, the Clinton strategy has always been both, both during the administration uh, and afterwards. And that is, we wanted to take giant steps, but we had to also bring industry along with us. In the case of the tobacco industry, it was pretty clear. They were marketing to kids. The health information was pretty straightforward. The government was not going to change the rules and ban tobacco in America. But we could ban tobacco for kids. And so a combination of private sector uh, initiatives, the campaign for tobacco-free kids, uh, public sector initiatives from state and local governments, uh, as well as the feds playing a role, that, that was, it wasn't as straightforward as it sounds because we had to also convince the White House at the same time. And the one thing I will point out is that the complication with the politics was not just with Congress. If you look at what the tobacco companies, Philip Morris in particular, was doing in minority communities, they were major funders of cultural activities in minority communities. There were a number of senior people working in the White House, political people, who had worked for Philip Morris. Uh, Democrats were tied to, um, uh, to some of that. So we had to wind our way around some of that politics. And Al Gore was very helpful. <clears throat> as was the president. Uh, we went directly to them. Uh, um, David Kessel and I actually bypassed some of that to go directly to them on our overall uh, strategy. But sometimes you'll, you'll take smaller steps, sometimes you'll take larger steps,
but the smaller steps have to be with lots of people taking smaller steps. They can't be with just, that's our strategy for today. They have to be with other steps going on at the same time. So um, uh, that's the way I look at it. They call it the boom boom theory of policy making. My nickname was boom boom because I like to attach, um, attack issues from different directions with different strategies, all to produce the same outcome, to reduce healthcare disparities or, or the incidence of tobacco in kids or, or something else. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask about a topic that hasn't come up, but has certainly been in the news. And as you know, uh, we've been doing work and have been pleased to work with the Clinton Foundation on, and this is prescription opioids. Yes, I, and you're going to have a you're going to have a, a public hearing or something or a, a town meeting on that issue, uh, right? Two weeks from yeah. uh, November 17th, so two no. weeks from uh, uh, today, um, we'll have that here. But I wondered your take on. Uh, on the opioid epidemic, you may have seen an article in the newspaper yesterday, the front page of the New York Times, about death rates in middle-aged uh, white Americans increasing, one of the few examples of increases in mortality uh, among a population compared with many other countries. And I just wondered um, your perspective on the best uh, policy solutions for what has been uh, unprecedented increases in morbidity and mortality associated with prescription opioids, and now in the past few years, as you know, heroin as well. Well, you know, I came from Florida where the painkiller docks were widespread and um, not well regulated. And one of the things I worried about once the legislature took them on was then we were in the process of uh, legalizing medical marijuana, which is just going to be a substitute. They're going to go into that business. It's the economics of it that you have to take on. And like the tobacco issue and all these other issues, you have to attack it from different directions. But our friend from, uh, with your experience in the FDA, probably has a better sense of that because it's not an issue in which you can have one piece of legislation or one policy. Everybody's got to work on it. Um, and the fact that there's so much money in it, um, and you have to eliminate, figure out some way of eliminating the income that comes from it. Caleb, is it too late to retitle the agenda, the boom boom agenda on prescription? Yeah. Because there, there are a lot of different points that yeah. you do need, need to hit, FDA being one of them, uh, as well as many, many others. Yeah. We're delighted to be joining you for that event, by the way. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time to speak with us today. I had a quick question about, uh, I had a quick question about how do you communicate the advantages of, or the benefits of scaling back interventions? I think this was um, somewhat related to, to what was discussed previously, but um, for instance, if you, uh, if public health professionals want to develop this alliance with cancer research um, or enter cancer research uh, in that way, um, there, around cancer screening, breast cancer screening, um, there, uh, several years ago the USPSTF uh, recommended scaling back the frequency of, of screening for certain populations. Um, and that was met with quite a bit of opposition uh, so as, as um, health re researchers approaching a question agnostically um, and, um, you know, if, if that leads to recommendations for, re for scaling back an intervention or scaling back screening, um, how do you communicate to the public without generating confusion? Um, anyway, any strategies that you have around that? Thanks. <laughs> I, I would say it, it is extremely difficult to ex explain to people why doing more may be worse off. And I've had multiple experiences at the city, state, and national level. People think you're taking something away from them. It's one of the hardest communication challenges. And um, there are, uh, 
it, it is an area where having good data is absolutely critical in terms of communication and to be able to explain the consequences of doing too much, but it is not easy. But, but again, Josh, I, I think that I keep coming back to the data alone are not going to necessarily drive these outcomes. So what are you doing? What are the political strategies? And what, in what in particular are the intermediate institutions that can help you out? So you for instance, partners. stakeholder boards, right? You know, community representatives and so forth that in some sense are in settings where they see the data, have access to the experts, and in some sense are then disciplined by the data and hopefully carry some of your water. But I, I'm, you know, I, I still continue to worry about how we do the translation of our best sense of what the state of the um, literature is on any given issue, and then what happens when you go out into the messy world of it, policy it, making. It really does matter to have good partners. When Ebola came up and people were wondering why we weren't doing A, B, C, D, and E, and we said we didn't have to do those things, we stood there with Johns Hopkins, the University of Maryland, and others to be able to send that message. And I think um, one of the important things when you're doing research is to be willing to stand with policymakers to help them. Uh, communicate very difficult topics. As, as David will remember, one of his predecessors as chair of this department, Leon Gordas, chaired a scientific advisory committee for the National Cancer Institute to recommend appropriate breast cancer screening for women. And they came out, this you know, thoughtful, independent group uh, came out with a recommendation, which isn't worth going into. Uh, immediately followed by the director of the National Cancer Institute and a very prominent senator saying that is the stupidest recommendation we've ever heard and everybody went off in the opposite direction. Right. And you know you just have to get everybody on board. That The key is getting everybody on board thinking about the rollout as opposed to just the science and um, that kind of coordination takes time and a, a lot of skill. One more Last question, Joe, you got it. Huh? Well, all right, Larry. If Joe does a short question, then, then you can. Thank you for a lovely conversation. I'm wondering whether you'd comment on the maturation of the Affordable Care Act as an opportunity for improved public health. <laughs> it, it's going to give everybody enormous data. We're going to have real data, because for the first time, we're doing prevention. Um, I had a couple of uh, home health workers who were taking care of my mother who had health care for the first time in their lives and they were so excited when they went to the doctor for the first time because they got physical exams which they had never really had as thoroughly and I, I think the data is going to be tremendous for public health even though it's still a very fragmented health care system where we're just filling in the, the gaps here but I think it's an opportunity to at least get some inkling at a large enough scale of what real universal health care would look like in the United States and, and what the next gaps are. I think the most important lesson of the Affordable Care Act is um, we know that we've got some problems with pricing because there are people that aren't taking it up, but the Affordable Care Act ought to tell us what the next big piece is to knit all this health care, health insurance systems at least, and health care together. And I think we've got enough people covered now that we can actually start to try to answer some of those questions. All right, last question. Great, um, thank you very much. Uh, I want to recount a very brief story and then get some advice um, because this is not evidence that came up as the decision making, as the deal breaker. I serve on a small board. Uh, it's called the Ryzen Foundation, and it's, what it did was advocate for a policy of replacing sugar-sweetened beverages with low-caloric low beverages, and it was actually passed in Howard County. There was a new county executive, and his first piece of legislation was to reverse that. Uh, the Ryzen Board met with him, and it was very clear that it had nothing to do with evidence, absolutely nothing to do with evidence, and he stated very explicitly, I am a libertarian, and this is not the role of government. So um, and I don't know whether it's epidemiology or, you know, or the law. What, what is, what, what, how can we approach that issue? Because I was almost speechless, because I was ready to, 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 to lay out the evidence. But evidence had nothing to do with the decision. So we can, personally, we can vote out the person, 
but that's not going to that's not a practical strategy at least in the short term do we just wait or how do you deal with that mindset that says it's not you know evidence is not what matters it's the role of government that is what i'm um you're going to vote on you surround them with people that think differently <laughs> What does the consul, what do the commissioners say? Uh, what do the parents say? What does the PTA say? Um, you overwhelm them with people that feel differently the same way lobbyists do on other kinds of issues. Um, but you're not gonna change, there are a lot of people whose minds are never gonna change. And I, I, you know, I was always anxious to change their behavior, not their minds. Um, and, but you're just going to run into that. That's what I mean by running into a brick, brick wall. You've got to find another way to do it. And maybe it's voluntary. And maybe it ends up to be voluntary because the evidence is overwhelming and the schools are willing to do it. It's just, it's just not a, an easy situation. I, and I shouldn't give people the impression that policy, uh, policy um, comes from policy makers. I mean, uh, particularly public health policymakers, they don't sit around at HHS thinking up new policies. They often come from the White House or from the Congress or, you know, at this moment, someone is following, some uh, college dropout is following around all those presidential candidates, Republicans and Democrats, with um, uh, a mini iPod writing down everything they're promising. And when one of them gets elected, um, they're going to turn that into a book and they're going to tear it apart and hand each part of it to a cabinet member. And the cabinet member is going to look and say, oh my God, he or she didn't say that, did they? <laughs> I mean, that's the way I got the immunization campaign. The president said, you know, I promised universal immunization, so you got to go do it. <laughs> So uh, we've gone over, which is to prove what a stimulating discussion this is, because it was this running into the reception and people are all sitting here, not caring about the reception too much. Uh, I think it's proof positive, as I said at the beginning, that the secretary is always the smartest and most potent person <laughs> in the room. And Donna, let me thank you. Uh, this has been a terrific, and thank the panelists as well. Great discussion.